uh, webinars are upcoming by going to prometheusradio.org slash webinars. And once those trainings have happened, uh, including after tonight's training, you can access the archives by going to prometheusradio.org slash archives, and that's where all of the trainings um, are archived away for your um, to, so that you can access them after the fact. So a little bit about the Prometheus Radio Project. We're a not-for-profit based in Philadelphia, and we've been around for about 15 years doing work to build participatory radio as a voice for community expression and a tool for social justice organizing. We exist to counter corporate consolidation and control of the media. Over time, the media has become less and less accessible to communities as corporations have acquired a bigger share of the media landscape. It's not in the interest of this small handful of corporations to effectively represent, celebrate, and affirm the varied communities that we are all a part of. We need to own our own media outlets to tell our versions of history, to make our own news that combats types and speaks truth to power, and to create positive changes in our own communities. And for the last 13 years, Prometheus has helped hundreds of communities start their own radio stations. Today, there are over 800 low-power FM radio stations on the air, and this fall, many new channels are becoming available across the nation. This is an opportunity for communities to own their own media infrastructure through starting low-power community radio stations. Here at Prometheus, when we say community radio, we mean transformative for both listeners and media members, participatory, as in democratically organized with community involvement in the production of content, and affordable and accessible stations with multimedia capabilities that are locally rooted. Here at Prometheus, we're on the ground in communities across the country, working with grassroots groups like the ones many of you joining us tonight are a part of. We want to use the media to create a more democratic society, and these trainings are part of our strategies to promote participatory radio as a part of building that society. Please consider supporting Prometheus, where your financial support today means a better media future. You can visit our website to support our work, uh, www.prometheusradio.org. So tonight, the nuts and bolts of programming, uh, just to focus in on the goals for this webinar, are to learn all the basics that you need to know about being on air, and also to learn a bit about designing and implementing uh, a radio program. Uh, and to help us with that is uh, Liz Humes, who is an artist, writer, radio host, activist, and mother. And she is one of the founding members of WRIR Richmond. At WRIR, she served as the president of the board of directors and currently volunteers a time as the locally produced program manager. She hosts her own uh, weekly show about books, words, and ideas called Wordy Birds. And uh, without further ado, Liz, I'm going to pass it over to you. I'll, I'll, uh, and I'll put up your slideshow for you. Terrific. And thank you for that. And also, um, I want to thank Prometheus again from all of us out here in LPFM land. You know, we would not exist. And, um, you know, so many lives have been changed because of WRAR, which is my station, and LPFM. And so, you know, I just want to thank you. And I hope that resonates all the way through to all the Prometheus people. But we just greatly, greatly appreciate all the work that you have done to get LPFM passed. And with that, there is my front page. Um, as we just said, I am Liz Humes, and um, I have served in just about every position in every um, at WRIR since before the beginning, uh, with the exception of I have never been a DJ, nor uh, my focus is news and talk, although the focus of this presentation is music, which is kind of funny. Um, but anyway, I have done just about everything from top to bottom at the radio station. So um, thank you for making it happen. And um, we are, like I just said, WRIR. That is our logo. And I am going to give you a quick kind of a tour of WRIR. Uh, we are located in Richmond, Virginia, right a little bit up from VCU. We're in the middle of the city. Um, our frequency is 97.3. And our, this is what our programming looks like. Um, from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, five days a week, we air news and talk programming. We've got, right now, I've got 10 half an hour shows that discuss local issues, and those are locally produced. In addition to those 10 half an hour shows, I have got two one hour talk programs that air on Thursdays and Fridays, but I couldn't, I designed this really rough calendar of programming. And, uh, 
it was taking me way too long, so I left out some things. But anyway, so in here at like 4 and 5 o'clock on Thursdays and Fridays are the other two hours of talk programming. At night and on weekends, we are music. And we air all different kinds. Of, we are non-genre specific. Uh, we air anything and everything that you wouldn't hear on the normal on a normal radio station, a normal commercial radio station. Um, this is how our, our station is structured. Um, we're run by the board of directors, and then we have an executive committee, and they manage really leases and you know and the rent and and just kind of the legal day-to-day -day stuff, but leadership really runs the radio station. And leadership is comprised of the different department heads from the major departments at WRAR. So it's marketing and news and public affairs, fundraising, operations, which is the building, events, and then music. And they meet monthly and talk about you know, the everyday operations of the station. Um, under that is the volunteer coordinator, but she really sits over here to the side and really they speak to her about their needs for volunteers and then she goes out and she finds them or searches through the volunteer applications and she finds people to fill the places that the various departments have. And then the FCC committee is, is somewhat of a human resources department in that you know, if anybody has an on-air violation, um, a lot, they manage a lot of employee cards or a, a lot of employee problems. They give away key cards. They're kind of they're kind of human resources, um, and so they're up here with leadership as well. And then the station is broken up into, like I said, marketing all the way down through music, um, news and talk is three different departments. In that, local programming is its own beast, and that is. Um, that's a lot of work, our 10 or 12 local shows plus all of the modules. And then it's the day-to-day -day board operations. And the board operators come in and they manage the satellite feeds. From, we used to have run NPR. We don't anymore, but the satellite feeds from like PRX, which is a content uh, provider, um, or Pacifica, for example. They manage all of the, all the national content and then they are our underwriting and, and, uh, and that um, I don't know, they manage the day-to-day the -day stuff. And then under news and public affairs, national programming falls under that. And then fundraising is underwriting and uh, fund drives and grants. And under them are various people, or under fundraising is various people. And operations, various people come in and, uh, and volunteer and assist us. And more on these later. And then events is a, a couple of dozen people go to events within the community. We put on events within the community. Um, two weeks from now, we're doing a musical history tour where we rent school buses. And we drive around the city and we talk about the music history within the city. Richmond, Virginia is a really, really, really old city. And, and in that, you know, we've got a lot of the nation's musical roots come out of Richmond. And so we work with the Library of Virginia. We work with VCU. We work with various music experts. And they come in and they stand in the tour bus and they talk about, you know, what happens around Richmond. And it's a really neat, neat thing that we put on. Um, and then music is, you know, the various genres of, of um, we've got different genre managers, and then they are all managed by the music programming director. So um, like the music director isn't going to have a vast in-depth knowledge of world music. So therefore, we have various genre directors, okay? And moving on, that's the station. This is the live room. And all of our news and talk happens here. Um, these fold down. I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but the, um, like the microphone stands fold down. And then we can set this up so that we can have a round table of 15 people on the radio, or it's just one-on-one, -on -one, or the news department runs their modules here. Um, and this is all. This is where all of our magic happens, as far as news and talk goes. And then what happens is um, the two tables fold down, and you can see on the left and the right of the screen, and they separate, and they go, and they're pushed into the corner. And then bands come in, and our bands play. We air lots and lots and lots of bands, and we do this at night and on weekends, and sometimes during the day if there's like a relevance 
you know, to a talk issue, but uh, but not as much. You know, all day Saturday and Sunday we have bands, and then mostly during our drive time we have quite a few bands as well. Um, and what happens is they, well, I'm going to go back to the screen for you, but you see this window here. And this is a kind of a comp uh, compressed picture of the room, so it's a little wider. But what happens is we have a guy that sits in here and he manages, um, I can't even explain. This is so far not my field in here and what this guy does who's talking at the window here. But he manages the sound and he mixes the sounds. And... Uh, that's him there, and that's what he does. He mixes the sound for the live bands, and then he feeds it into, this is the broadcast booth, and the, mirror, the window would be over here on the left. And um, so what happens is this is David Noyes, and David Noyes can see all the way through and talk to the bands and interview the bands, and um, it's really amazing. And then, so this is our mix board here in the middle, and then, you know, those are our tape decks. We have uh, DJ shows on Saturday night, so people, you know, DJs come in and they mix their own music live on the radio, and then we have all kinds of guest DJs that come in and mix their own music live on the radio. And that's a really amazing thing because that's art happening live. And uh, anyway, and this is Charles, and he's one of our world music directors or managers or DJs, I guess. And uh, it's just we've got CDs on the wall. And um, anyway, it's just another shot of the studio. So I've got these weird things that have popped up here at the top of my screen. Um, but anyway, so I can't read my headline, but, oh, there it is. Okay, it says becoming a WRR volunteer. So we've got about 200 people that come in weekly to help us run the station. Um, that being said, we have a waste of people who want to volunteer, of people who want to be DJs. We can't manage the, the amount of people that want to get involved. Um, it is a fantastic thing. And when you open your doors and you start to promote yourself, people will come out of the woodwork. And what's remarkable about WRAR is the quality and the skill sets that people have to offer. And I am really, really positive that you are going to find the same thing will happen in your community. Um, you know, we have lawyers and, you know, PhDs and doctors, and it's just people who care about the community, people who care about music, you know, and don't necessarily get their, their hunger filled in their daytime, but, you know, they come through. Um, it's, it's really, really remarkable the, the quality of people that, that you will find yourself working with. Um, so I've got you know 70 active DJs, and then we've got 10 rotating DJs. I've got about 30 people who come in and work the boards for news and talk, and that includes the rotators. Um, work the boards Monday through Friday, you know, 8 to 5 a.m. or 8 to 5 p.m. Then the talk programmers I was talking about, and that's the 10 local shows plus modules plus the news people. And then we've got reporters. And we've got uh, people who come in and do nothing but live sound for the bands, and they help like the local shows edit their programs. They help the DJs edit their programs. They record modules for like the pledge drives. Um, and by modules, I mean like testimonials where people come in, like celebrities will come in and talk about how great the station is and help people to. Um, you know, play, give to WRAR, very similar to what Lee did in the beginning of this, and then but we'll broadcast the testimonial. So that's kind of the thing that the programmers or the live sound and the production people do. And then um, during the day, we have, and this is really flexible, but we have 10 people that come in and man the offices and answer the phones and get the mail and just sort out like the people that come through and, and want to drop off their CDs during the day. And those are split up. There's two shifts, a morning shift and an afternoon shift, five days a week, and they come in and do that. They also do things like they Windex, and um, they kind of clean up around the station. And then we have marketing and social media people, and then, like, and then um, events people, and then we're into people who just come in and volunteer, but their jobs are too specific, and so I didn't put them out here. And they all have to fill out, everybody that walks into the station has to fill out a, a volunteer application. And they also have to pass an FCC test, and I'll get to that later. But I wanted to show you guys the volunteer application, and I hope I don't lose us, but I'm going to do it. No, nope, good. Okay. Can everybody see that? Did the volunteer application pop up on everybody's screen? You know what? Everybody is muted, so I don't know. 
Um, if not, if it didn't pop up, what I can do, what you can do is click through the link. And basically what they do is, is if they call in or if they email in, they're sent to this. And this is also on our website. And then what we do here is we ask people about their skills and what they want to do. And then what happens is these all get sorted and the volunteers get sent to the different directors. And our, we function almost totally virtually. All of our business operations happen online. Like we have our studios, but everybody works from home and we go into the studio to do our shows and to have meetings. But all of this back end stuff happens virtually. Um, so this all gets sorted and then uh, and then sent to the various departments. And you can get a take a look at this more in depth on um, and this is on our website. All right. So now I'm going to click out of this and go back to the um, I'm going to click out of the chat thing too so I can see, and go back to the uh, PowerPoint here. Okay? So then managing 200 people. This is just some basic stuff for that we have found. So WRER is managed from the bottom up. Like all decisions are made by the committees. And in fact, like my org chart that I brought up earlier is really somewhat inaccurate because it's almost like the board of directors is at the bottom. Um, there are some things that you're going to find that just need to be managed, and then everything else does in our policies. Particularly, like we are completely. I mean, you know, you need a key to get into the building, but as far as our equipment goes, it's open. And um, so we have a checkout system, but it's really pretty loose. My point in telling you all of this is that one of the things that you can do to minimize stress on yourselves as managers is just make a flat policy. No drunk people at the studio. You know, no drinking, no drugs. Because while everybody has a beer or two, there are people who have more than the beer or two and it creates problems. And so we have, after nine years, we've been on the air for nine years, we just have a flat no drinking policy. Um, and also, anyone that takes a live microphone, meaning you know, is live on air, they cannot, by FCC law, be on, uh, be on under the influence of anything. And that is that is by law. So, kind of the law has written it so that we can make this policy without having to be a bunch of um, square pants. So anyway, uh, but our equipment is our property and we allow people to check it out. And then another policy is that um, we've had to make is that WRER offices and our computers and things are for business purposes only um, because people will come in and they'll clog up the computers and watch movies and whatnot. And um, so we've had to go through and make sweeping clauses but about um, just just really basic stuff, but the rest of it is extraordinarily open, and people are people get it you know there 's no reason to overregulate or make excessive policies people are you know people are so mature and wonderful and uh, so anyway that 's a bit of the back end stuff housekeeping. Um, really, housekeeping is pain in the neck in that um, people don 't clean up after themselves so um, we have we have a cleaning crew that we've paid for over the years, and right now we've got a cleaning crew on trade. So we give them on air underwriting dimensions for uh, the work that they do. But they just really they just vacuum and wipe. And but the day to day stuff is still managed by the office managers and by the regular volunteers. Um, and as you can see, oops, I had said back here, you know, we don't allow people to eat in the studio. But as you can see, people still eat in the studio. Um, this over here, this is Greta Brinkman, and she is one of our regular volunteers. Greta, Greta um, is the basis for Moby, the huge Moby Moby, and she was also in L7, and now she lives in Richmond, Virginia, and she is a really active volunteer for us. And this guy has a super cool story in that he was a clear channel DJ and had to live around the corner and didn't know about us five or six years ago, was miserable doing his job because he couldn't play what he wanted to play and dropped something in front of our doors 
and looked up, and at the time we didn't have that etching on the front of our door, and looked up and saw a piece of paper, and uh, immediately quit his job and came to work for, or to volunteer for WRAR so he could do his thing. And this is Dustin, and he's just a nice guy, but apparently he can't read and follow directions because he's eating in the studio. But he's, he's a wonderful, wonderful person, and I'm not disparaging him at all. Um, so going forward, oh, one more thing. Um, email protocol, uh, we do have to restrict the email. Like I said, everything is, is virtual in that um, we ask people to leave if the emails get too aggressive, um, slanderous, or just generally unprofessional. And if, you're, you know, if your studio is managed like ours, I think in the end um, you'll have to come up with just a blanket, you know, no crap talk about anybody in the emails. Oh, and then also like people will send out stuff about needing jobs and selling their cars and with two to three hundred people on the email at a time, we just have to kind of knock that out too and say you, you can't do that or we'll vote your privileges. But that said, um, WRER is a very, very happy and place and really all of the policies that you know we put into effect, effect across the board are, are pretty nice and friendly. Um, going forward, okay, and then rules and regs for specifically DJs, and this is all kind of FCC stuff, okay. Um, let's see. First of all, how do we get new DJs? Um, word of mouth, Craigslist. They walk up off the street like Enzo, or they come in from other departments and then they say they want to be DJs. They submit a playlist, a two-hour long playlist to the music director. Um, and then, you know, we kind of look at that and determine whether what they are proposing as a program fits our fits our mission. And then um, um, and our mission is news, views, and music, otherwise unheard on local airwaves to add a platform for cultural diversity in Richmond. And um, anyway, so that's our mission. And so the music director will look at that and say, you know, you want to do a pop show, but all you have on here are top 40 pop songs. And that really doesn't jive with what we're trying to do because there are 10 other clear channel stations running that kind of stuff. So, you know, and, we, you know, we're polite to everybody, but, you know, and what we say is, you know, maybe you're better fit somewhere else. Um, so anyway, after, after their playlist is accepted, then they go through a training process. And what they do, it's a three-week process. And they sit with the DJs uh, for the first week, and they just kind of learn about the equipment and how things work, and um, they just kind of sit there and observe. The second week, we give them more hands-on experience. We give them microphone experience. They teach them how to read slowly on the radio, um, how to speak into the microphone. Um, like you know, it says here, cue up songs. And then the third week, like the DJ may still, the scheduled DJ may still program the show, but he'll roll over and or she will roll over and let the other person do the actual behind the board stuff. And uh, and then the DJ assesses and assesses the, the potential applicant and then they go on and they're either yayed or nayed. And um, they can be sent to um, you know, back through for more training. And right now we have a wait list, but for us you know, they will be sent to the middle of the night and then they have to rough it out because those are the only spaces available and they'll rough it out in the middle of the night until something opens up. Um, and it sits here on the bottom and I'll just read this out loud. Um, training is required for all DJs whether they have been on any other radio station or not and that they've just got to learn our board. And um, so then, and I think I do this out of order, and I'm sorry. But what they do, so DJs, you're going for your shift, and you have your stack of, of you don't have a stack of MP3s, but you have your MP3s or your albums or your, your CDs, and um, you get yourself together, and you know what you're going to play, and then you open up a program log, and the program log provides the DJ with a schedule of what they're supposed to read, underwriting, PSAs, and promos. And um, and then concert tickets as well. And then we get a lot of concerts, or a lot of a lot of um, clubs come to us, or venues come to us, and and offer us free tickets. And so we give those on the away on the radio. And then, oops, I'm going to back up. And that this is this is where I was out of sync. And this is what the program log looks like. And I did it again. I 
swung over top here. So I don't know if you can see this audio options, but I dropped down something here. I don't know if that's appearing on everybody's screen or just mine. But anyway, so this is the log. And um, so this log here runs for quite a few months. And the underwriting manager will go through and write in different – so this is a blank one. And he'll go through and he'll write in the underwriting that uh, Global Agogo needs to read. And then what Bill will do, Bill is the host, and what Bill will do is just sign off and he'll write the time that he has read the underwriting. And then he also um, checks off like – that he's read the two PSAs. He has to read one PSA or broadcast. Some of our PSAs are pre-recorded, um, or he has to broadcast them once an hour. And that's station policy that uh, PSAs are read or broadcast once an hour. And then the promos as well. And that's for promos are basic in-house um, in-house events. And then what this is, we have one of these for every single radio show out there. And it's all put together in a great big three-ring binder. And so the DJ comes in and he pulls out the binder at the beginning of a show and um, he pulls up the log and he gets himself organized and he sees what he has to do. And then, uh, and then he moves on. And um, going back though, and he does all of this stuff during his mic breaks. And um, a basic mic break should include, as it says here, the station call letters and our frequency and web address and then the name of your show. And I like it when the DJs give the time all the time. Um, and so we put in there that they have to give the time. By law, um, by law, and this is now Lee's radio show is in Canada. That's what she said, and Lee broadcasts out of Canada. So it's so in the United States. I don't know where everybody's from, but in the United States, by FCC law, all stations have to give at the top of every hour um, a legal station ID. And the legal state ID, and you, you may be writing furiously, but a lot of this stuff can be found over and over and over again in all kinds of books. And I can direct you later on to some, some decent books. But the legal station ID is it's our call letters, which if you're all LP, which would have to include the LP, your frequency. For us, it's 97.3, and then the FM, and then the city or county of residence. Um, so we are Richmond, Virginia. Okay, so that our legal ID at the top of every hour, which is um, within two minutes. So that is at, let's say it's um, 6 p.m. So within two minutes of the top of the hour means spot within somewhere after 5.59 and before 6.01, we have to, okay, of, of every hour of programming, um, you know, what is it, 24 times a day. Okay. Um, now, oops, there's that. Okay. Now, some, something that is new that has come up within the last nine years is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And this is a new law. And we stream our programs. And I'm assuming that everyone out there is going to stream their signal in addition to their terrestrial broadcast, and to, in, in addition to their frequency broadcast. The DMCA basically um, – the DMCA is a good thing, and it protect, uh, protects artists, and it protects musicians. And um, basically what it does, the DMCA is legislation enacted by the Congress in 1998, and it made major changes to the Copyright Act. Um, basically, as far as radio goes, so someone can record a radio show and then download it, and then repost it online for download later. Okay, we all used to do it with our mixtapes, you know, or I used to do it with mixtapes in you know junior high. I would record the radio show and and uh, and then own own my own my songs. Great, they were terrible. But anyway, so the same thing can happen here. So the DMCA had to come up with ways to protect the artists. So. Um, what they've done is this Digital Millennial Copyright Act stops people from putting music on the web or protects people from putting music on the web so that it can't be reproduced or it makes it really difficult for them to reproduce and distribute copies of music. Okay. Um, and then so how does it affect what DJs play? Okay. So DJs cannot play more than um, – 
no more than three tracks from a given album and no more than two consecutively within a three-hour period, okay? So you can't play Willie Nelson's, um, I'm trying to think of an album name by Willie Nelson, but you can't play uh, any one album or from one album off of Willie Nelson, three songs and no more than two consecutively within a three-hour period. I know you can just read this online. Um, Okay, you can't play any more than four tracks to give an artist and no more than three consecutively um, in a two-hour period, and then four songs from a box set and no more than three consecutively within a three-hour period, uh, within a two-hour period, okay? So, and then it's a violation. So all of our DJs post, their playlists on time or online. And uh, what they can't do is they can't post their playlists ahead of time, which is kind of a drag. Um, and then, like it says here, and a lot of this stuff is on my website, and a lot of this stuff is a copy and paste from, the, um, from our DJ handbook, which is also available online um, on the WRA website. But then, so here you have to... Um, by law, post the song title and the album, and then the featured artist in text during the performance of the song. Okay, and then this is all again. So it sounds overwhelming, but this is all online, and you will get it, and you'll get it in your head, and you'll get yourself up to speed. Um, and then podcasts. W R E R doesn't. We have our our website. Um, a podcast is. An, um, an illegal reproduction of a copyrighted song. Um, you can get legal reproduction licenses, but you need to reproduce somebody's song. You need written permission from the artist, from the label, and then from the distributor. Okay, and it is, when you're talking about you know shows that are that are. 40 songs long to get written permission from all of these people is a huge pain in the neck. Okay, that's the legal way to podcast somebody's music. So, WRER's board of directors, we can't allow we can't allow DJs to put on our websites their podcasts. Um, and so, what if the DJ wants to record his program and put it on their own website? They are free to do that all day, every day. But we don't. Um, Right, but we don't. It doesn't fall under what our board of directors um, considers their risk. You know, so they're doing it at their own at their own risk. Okay, um, overwhelming stuff. But anyway, anyway. Um, but that said, we stream, and so some of the stuff that I was talking about before is a different is different. Streaming is different than making music available for downloading. And what I was talking about before, with you know the um, you know. Uh, three tracks from any given album within a two-hour period. That's all for streaming, okay? Um, okay, and then other stuff. So that's the DMCA. It's really intimidating, but then it's not once you get it in your head. It's pretty pretty simple, and once you get the DJs to understand what they're supposed to do, then we, we have no problems. Um, you know, again, it is against the law for DJs to drink or smoke pot before they go onto their, uh, they take up a live microphone. Um, and again, it's an FCC violation. And then for us, we have a blanket policy that we don't allow DJs to swear during Safe Harbor or not, okay? Um, like Safe Harbor is after 10 o'clock at night and before 6 a.m. And so, you know, music can drop the F-bomb all they want during Safe Harbor, but we just... I don't know. It's a little bit crude for DJs to, to swear on the radio, so we just don't let them do it, safe harbor or not. We don't think it's necessary. Okay, but that's all up to you guys and how you want to run your station. Um, I don't know if this is working, but then I'll do a quick link to this DJ quiz down here. And the DJs are all, after they, before they can go on the air, we make them take a DJ quiz. And so that... We know and they know that they have read and understand FCC law. And this is on our website, and you can click to it uh, later if you want to look thoroughly. And um, just so they understand our policies and just the complications of the DMCA and some of the FCC law that I'm going to get to in a bit. Um, anyway, and... Uh, 
Um, so anyway, that's just something that they have to do before they take up the microphone for WRFR. And it may sound heavy-handed, but you know, hundreds, hundreds of people have volunteered their time and their hours and all of the community's donations. And so we just feel like it's, it's safe and sorry. We're better safe than sorry. So flipping over. All right, so moving on to the FCC. Um, all right, the FCC, and I've got this thing. Oh, thank you very much, Lee. All right, FCC rules and regulations, and I'm going to go through really quickly some of this stuff, um, the difference between obscenity and profanity and libel and defamation. And um, the National Federation of Community Broadcasters, I bought a book from them. It's a great big, heavy three-ring binder that they provided nine years ago. And I strongly suggest that you guys all buy this book. I'm sure it's been updated in the last nine years. Um, and I don't know, you know, I don't know if Prometheus provided something like that, but um, anyway, go online, get your laws, and um, just make sure that everybody knows what's going on. And reading law is a bear, but you can do it. I did it. Um, we have other people at the station. You sit down, you figure it out, you interpret it, and uh, and go on. And like I said, we have an FCC committee that um, we pass. If there is some questionable thing about who has done what, instead of like the managers having to manage this questionable language um, or questionable politicking, we'll just pass it on to the FCC committee, and then uh, and then they manage it. And it's a great way to not have to deal with. Uh, human um, human issues. Okay. So anyway, so there will be no pictures for the next couple of uh, uh, slides, and I and I don't apologize about that. Um, okay. Obscenity. And obscenity is by law it is graphic or explicit depictions of sexual act and uh, pornography. Okay. There's a difference between obscenity and profanity. All right. No one can air obscenity. Um, obscenity, God, it's an obscenity, obscenity at any time. That is 24/7. Okay, no obscenity at all, and it is not protected by the First Amendment, and you cannot broadcast it at any time. Um, okay, so it is community. It is stuff that the community finds obscene, and it is also very gray, but it is by your own community standards. So some communities find the phrasing goddamn unacceptable. Others don't bat an eyelash at it all. So it's all community standards. During the day for us, we avoid goddamn, but, um, you know, because people find it obscene, but then others don't. Um, I say to people that um, when we're talking about obscenity, it is... Um, Exact explanations of what goes where and um, excessive conversations of bodily fluid. That's how I explain um, obscenity. And uh, this down here, patently, patently offensive, is it is very, very gray as to what that means. Um, we err on the side of caution, but you know, patently offensive, depending on the tone and the tenor of the FCC can have all different kinds of, of areas. And I think that really depends on who is president at the time, what patently offensive means, okay? Um, indecency and profanity, okay, like I said, safe harbors are between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. And you can air foul language, you can air um, profane language, but um, and before, after 6 a.m. and before 10 p.m., you can't. Um, okay. And I want you guys to, I don't want to get into this really very much. Um, I, I, you know, you can read it on your own, even though I, I kind of copied and pasted from our website and from our handbook. Um, but I think it's something that, that your station needs to manage individually um, and on your own, okay? So moving forward, libel and defamation. Libel and defamation is something, if you're going to have news departments, that people need to be made aware of. And they are, you know, libel and defamation is untruthful statements about a person or organization published in writing or through broadcast media that injures a person's reputation or standing in the community. Um, so it's libel. Um, 
anyway, so they can't get on your they can't disparage a person's character um, or integrity, even if this person is, you know, um, Lindsay Lohan or Britney Spears. I mean, you can talk about her acts as they are true and real, but you really don't want your DJs getting on the radio and calling her or anyone, and I don't any one person, but calling anyone a whore or saying, um, anything terrible about them. Um, and then you know, they cannot, our DJs can't use their program to air personal grievances or attack upon any person, character, their integrity, honesty, or personal qualities um, on any individual or group. And, um, you know, we are not a bully pulpit. And um, for us, you know, we don't see ourselves as being set up as a bully pulpit. That said, you know, within the spectrums of our programs and by the programming, by the programming we choose and the PSAs we choose to run, the the tone and the temperament of what we do can be conveyed. You know, we are progressive, we air Pacifica, we air PSAs that tend to be a little bit more liberal in content. You know, and you can choose your programming any way you see fit and then but you know for us we've chose chosen to let the DJs and the talk hosts let other people do the talking about opinions and we kind of reshape the conversation but we refrain from stating our own opinions as much as possible. Um, okay now legally political opinions um, as NCEs are non-commercial education educational broadcast stations we cannot endorse or oppose any candidate running for public office. So once they go and they register themselves as a candidate, all conversation about them, unless it's in, within the spectrum of news, like has to stop. So if you were running um, a PSA recorded by Joe or Joe Councilman so and so back, you know, a year and a half ago, once he announces that he's running for office, you have to pull him, pull that PSA out of rotation. Um, also, like our programmers can't endorse, and this is by law too, that we can't endorse or oppose any pending legislation. All right, um, some national uh, or statewide bill or local bill uh, that is coming up. Um, my talk host can't get on the radio and say, you know, they want to reroute the buses, you know, vote this way. They can't, they can't do that. Um, and that is under, LPFM is very loosely regulated, but this, this um, political opinion clause is, is not. I mean, it's, it's pretty darn cut and dry for all non-commercial educational stations. Um, our license is tied up in the fact that we are there to educate the public. And education is really broad in that it can be, um, you know, you're teaching them about music, you know. We're teaching them about, you know, we air a pet. We're teaching them about pets. I mean, it's it's really a broad a broad saying, but we cannot endorse or oppose with the public's media or the public bandwidth any polit or any politician. So, moving forward, um, underwriting and PSAs, and this is something you're going to have to watch out for. In that, when you're when the DJs or the board operators are reading underwriting, um, they will say that they love, you know, Mama Zoo's, which is a restaurant here in the city. You know, uh, Mama Zoo's got an underwriting mention. They'll talk about it. And then it's really natural for people to turn around after they read their underwriting and go, I had dinner at Mama Zoo's the other night. and It was amazing. You know, thank you for your contribution to WRAR. They can't endorse or oppose it because it is considered payola and plugola, but it is an, it is an underwriting violation. Okay, and that also rolls into um, they've got PSAs on here, and I kind of beg to differ. Um, but anyway, they can't they can't endorse or, or they can't endorse an underwriting mention. Okay, um, and then call to action is telling someone to go and do something, and that also falls under the the language of underwriting. In your underwriting, you can't tell anyone to go and do anything. And then DJs, like I was saying before, can't say you know if if uh, Band X bought a series of underwriting mentions on WRAR. 
you know, we can't say after we read their PSA, we can't say, go see them. You know, their CD release party is on this night. You guys should all go and see or go check out their website or go do anything. Now, if they're not running underwriting, it's a completely different story. Um, you can talk about them um, and you can say pretty much whatever you want. And so it kind of makes for like CD underwriting mentions a little bit tricky in that, uh, if you want to talk about them, don't take their money. Um, so going on. And then drug lyrics. And this is something that we dealt with and that there's no ban on it. It's up to you guys to use your own discretion as far as drug lyrics go and glamorizing drug lyrics or gun lyrics or whatever it is that's your you know issue of, of concern. Um, but there is no like public policy or there is no FCC policy on that. And then Plugola and Paola. Um, Plugola at times, like a lot of our DJs DJ out in clubs around town. Almost all of them do, or play in bands. And um, they will offhandedly say that, you know, I'm playing at this show on Friday night, you know, on the microphone, uh, live during their show. They'll say, I'm playing at this show on Friday night. You guys come down and see me. Well, if that DJ is getting paid to play at the venue, they can't then, by him mentioning and telling the audience to come down, and as good-natured as that can possibly be, it is considered plugola. Um, and so he can't mention within the spectrum of his program if he is making money off of a show that he is playing the show because it is considered plugola. Okay? Um, show meaning outside of after his shift is over, like if he's, you know, in a band on stage and he says, come see me, you know, play in my band, and, you know, they are making money off the door. He can't do that on your radio station. And then payola, um, like I was talking about before with the CDs, payola is us talking about a CD where we have received underwriting for it. If we talk about it, it could be construed as Payola. And um, so anyway, it's, it's, it's tough what you can talk about and what you can't talk about. Mostly, you know, we tell the DJs, talk about you, the music you played and uh, what you have coming up next and give the time and play the promos and, um, you know, and talk about the history of the music that you've played. But um, so anyway, anyway, daunting. And then the public inspection file for an LPFM. Um, every public station has to have, large or small, rich or poor, has to have a public inspection file. And this file, there's a, a complete list of things that you need to have, and you can get this on the FCC's website. And um, also on the FCC's website, there's a checklist for all of the postings that you need to have around the station um, and all of the things that need to be advertised. So, but in your public inspection file, you need to have any complaints that have come into the station, um, and then if you are going to have a candidate who is running for public office, you have to show proof that you made it available to the opposing candidate. Um, and you have to have that in your public file. So equal oh God, I'm so all over the place. I'm so sorry. But in your public file, you have to show equal time. And you have to keep record of it in the public file. And then it will happen to all of us that at any given time, whenever the wind blows, the FCC will walk into your radio station and do a spot check. And um, they're going to want to see the public inspection file. Every DJ, every person in your station needs to know where the public inspection file is because the FCC will one day walk in and need to see it. And um, so anyway, so then they show it to them and then it has the public inspection file has to have all of your, your stuff laid out. If we were all full powers, the public inspection file is much more cumbersome and much more taxing. And one of the things that a lawyer had said to me, a media lawyer had said to me, and I was like a media lawyer at the FCC, said that LPFM was established um, and like the public inspection file, it, it's, it's so much easier and it's, and it's a kind of radio station where the, the burden is not as heavy on us to just maintain the radio station because we are so small. Whereas full powers have to prove like their community service and what they run over the past month and you know, as far as community service program, we don't have to keep records of all of this. 
that. We just it's really very minimal to do. But there are some things like proving that you have made your airwaves available to opposing candidates for public office during election time. Um, the license complaints and a handful of other things have to be in the public inspection file. Um, oh, there's a big one. Oh gosh, I can't think of what it's called. But uh, oh, uh, test to prove that you have run that your emergency service or your emergency broadcasting is um, in working order, and you have to have that in the public inspection file. But um, anyway, um, so every DJ needs to know where it is. Everybody needs to know where it is, and then on that day that they walk in there it is, and it's all ready for them. It is not overwhelming. It is something that's very, very easy to maintain and uh, just, a, just a thing, okay? And then so also, like I said before, we require that all on-air personality, whether that is board op or DJ or talk host or person coming in to do the pledge drive, we make sure that they know what the FCC law is and that they, have to ta they take this quiz. Um, and for some reason, my link isn't working. But you can go to our website, and the, the link is like paperwork for volunteers. And then in that link are all of our quizzes and the volunteer application and um, all of our quizzes. We have like one quiz or two quizzes. And if I had my way, we wouldn't have any quizzes. But um, the quiz is so that people can, um, so that you can take a look and see if it's something that you want to emulate or not. And then let me see what else we have up here. Um, but everybody, everybody has to do it. And I guess that is it as far as what it takes to be on air. And then Nee had asked me, and this is really super teeny tiny. I'm sorry. Lee had asked a list of um, like licenses. And so what this is is this is our finance department's budget. And I don't know if you guys can see it, but um, some of the things that you need to do is insurance. Um, and your board of directors is going to need broadcasters, liability, insurance, and then your directors and officers are going to need liability insurance. And um, through your board of directors, you know they assume legal responsibility for, you know, everything that happens on the radio. On the radio, and uh, so anyway, um, you guys need to get broadcasters' liability insurance, and you can pretty much call. I didn't set this up. Somebody else had set this up, so I apologize. But you can pretty much call State Farm, and I'm sure like State Farm or, or major. Um, Insurance agencies can direct you as to how to how to get it. Um, we file so our license, our nonprofit filing license, and this is a screen I have later on, but it's here in front of me. Um, we have to file annually to be a nonprofit and to solicit funds as a nonprofit in the state of Virginia, and we file annually. Every state, I did a little bit of research about this last night, and every state I guess has their own filing to be a um, a nonprofit, and so that is something that you should consider uh, later on. Um, you know, you don't have to. I mean, you have to do it, and that's an annual filing. We pay one of the greatest expenses, in my opinion, is we pay a bookkeeper. Um, we are all artists, and you know, a lot of us. You know, you're, the average person through a door isn't necessarily gonna wanna spend their volunteer time bookkeeping and sending out invoices and just managing the books. And by having a bookkeeper, I said it was one of the greatest expenses for us, for me, in that I didn't have to worry about the business of it, you know, if it was being done. Um, you know, that said, like our, our treasurer, I mean, he had, a, he had a lot of work to do, but pay for a bookkeeper. Is my, that's my word of advice. Um, and this is an older budget because I had said to you before that we pay for the cleaning service. Um, so then this, this is like what it takes us. This $53,000, $54,000 is what it takes us kind of to run the business end of WRIR every year. And you're depending on, you know, rent and all of that stuff. It just we pay almost $30,000 a year in rent. Um, so, oh, we rent uh, fake towers. We rent where our tower is from somebody else and we shoot our signal over to them. Um, this is a quick rundown of what we spend annually-ish per, per committee, okay? Um, 
you know, operations that's for upkeep, marketing, um, news and public affairs. We recently got rid of all of our NPR programming. So news has gone way down, but that's going to go back up because we want to start paying. And we do pay some of the news people. Um, finance, but that's a quick rundown of what it costs us per year to run WRER in Richmond, Virginia, the way we do it. Okay, um, going forward. And then miscellaneous broadcast fees. We asked me for this too. Okay, so we pay ASCAP and BMI and we pay CMJ and we pay Sound Exchange. And Sound Exchange is the, and this is a loose term, but it's the taxing group for the DMCA. Um, the D Digital Millennial Copyright Act. And so we pay them so that we can air artists music and artists stuff on the radio over the website. And then we also pay online streaming fees. Um, and we pay right now, we're not getting the greatest deal, but we pay about a dollar per user for streaming fees. And um, I went into this before about your state of licensure and you know I, I don't know I don't know what your how it works in your state. For us it's annual and you saw earlier that it was two hundred bucks. Um, so Anyway, and that is my presentation as far as a little bit of who we are, what we do. And my name is Liz Humes, and please feel free to email me. There's my email on the bottom. Um, please feel free to email me if you know you need specifics, or I can direct you to various department heads. If you're a managed department, um, I can direct you to department heads for a more comprehensive or you know uh, department answer. So. Anyway, um, that's all I got. Great. Uh, okay. Thank you, Liz. That was very comprehensive. Um, and so I just want to open up uh, the chat box here. And if folks have any questions, one thing I will say is that um, uh, definitely, like I said, this um, this presentation presentation will be archived, so folks will be able to watch and listen uh, in the future to go over some of the um, some of the points that. Um, that uh, Liz went over, and then also Liz, I'm not sure. Maybe we could even take some of the things that are out of your out of your presentation and uh, make a small document that can be attached with the archive, if that's okay with you, so that folks can access some of those links and take a look at your um, DJ quiz and stuff like that, which I think are really and volunteer application, which I think are really helpful templates for people setting up programming at their own stations in the future. I think so. Um, yeah. So, are there any questions about? Um, about programming, about any of the licensing fees, or about any of the um, any of the structure with programming uh, out there. I think that that was really a lot of information. I feel like we covered a lot of ground as far as what the FCC um, uh, demands of you by law. And then I think what a really important thing that Liz you pointed out is that you know there's going to be some differences between stations about depending on the communities that you're serving, what the kind of volunteers that are involved at your station, um, that's really going to determine determine rather, I think, some of your policies about what you want, you know, what what you think is appropriate to have on air. Uh, and I think that was a really important point that you made. Absolutely. Um, Everybody's going to do it different, and your work structure is going to be different. And um, yeah, so this is just the way that we do it. You know, it's right. not. I don't know if it's right, and hopefully somebody else will contact me later and tell us the right way to do it. But um, that's just the way we do it. So yeah, and then I'm going to pass it over to you again. Yeah, uh, sure. And I'm just seeing some questions that people have about. Um, other training. So there's some uh, training for DJs, and I. This is a question I have as well. It looks, and I was just looking at your, um, at the quiz. Um, and is there other additional training for um, DJs or staff or other programmers around? Um, I guess anything from. I see someone is asking here about like labor law training, but I guess like, and I'm thinking there's based on other questions that we have here. Other additional trainings I'm thinking of like community outreach trainings or anti-oppression trainings or anything that sort of like to I guess grow the educational side of the station or get folks to engage with maybe um, ideas or push the kind of some of the skills that they already have, skills and experience they already have. Um, so we train people. WRER is like a conduit for the community. Um, so we don't necessarily like 
there's plenty of volunteers who are really, really active in so many different aspects of the community. I mean, we've just got amazing people. But as far as like what we push, you know, we, we don't do any of the like the um, I don't we don't do any any of the stuff that you just mentioned. What we'll do, we'll really, really train people on how to do a talk show. We will really, really, really train people on how to edit audio. Um, you know, people come to, one of the things that I'm most proud of is that people wanting to improve their skill sets will come to us and we will train them on basic office management, um, you know, um, how to create spreadsheets. I mean, it, it can be very, very elementary all the way up through, you know, um, the nuts and bolts of like wiring antennas and satellites and, um, you know, so we'll teach them everything that we can possibly teach them to make WRAR better. And then they take those skill sets and so many people have gone on outside of the radio and gotten jobs in fields that we have trained them or used I write I write one letter of recommendation every single week um, for somebody and they use their skill sets or the things that they learned at WRAR to you know, bolster their resumes and to improve their lives. Um, but everything we do in house is for the radio. It, it just is too, for us, so large. Um, we, ha we have to draw a line. It's, you know, it's a radio, it's for radio use, like the radio building and the equipment is for radio use only. And then this other activist stuff that isn't around WRER, we kind of pass. You know, we, we say there's other community spaces out there for it. Now, I will use my radio broadcast signal, and we'll talk about all of this stuff all day, every day, you know, um, if that's necessary. But we don't do any anything that's not radio-related within WRAR. Right, which is, and I think that also varies from station to station, where some stations are more um, specifically, get, just depending on what kind of communities I think are serving. There's different kinds of trainings that you can bring into kind of a broader vision of programming or narrower vision or whatever, your particular vision of programming that suits, again, your station. And that, again, I think is what's so important about low power FM and smaller community uh, run stations is that you get to make those decisions. That's making the decisions about what's going to happen, what the programming looks like, and what it means to be a programmer. And I think that's the most important uh, point for people to take away from this awesome uh, thing that you put there is that there's so many, there are certain limits that, of course, we're all working in dealing with FCC regulations and other um, regulations, but really it's it's up to um, the people at your station and your, um, and uh, yeah, to make those decisions for, for your own communities. Uh, if there aren't any um, further questions, some uh, there's some stuff here that I think will be answered, uh, would be best directed to the support um, prometheusradio.org. So if you have other questions about um, about programming, you can always get in touch with our applicant support team that way, or filling by filling out an applicant support profile on our uh, on our site. Uh, and uh, since we're a little bit past eight o'clock, I think um, we're going to wrap it up. I see Liz, you put your email there, and I'll um, direct people can also. Uh, get a hold of us here at Prometheus with their questions or uh, get in touch with Liz or I think um, you know the WRIR website is a great um, resource as well to go look at the different uh, options as far as programming, taking a look at their schedule uh, and seeing the other resources that they have for their own programmers there. So uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. It's a great training. Thank you so much to Liz um, for passing along this information, for preparing this for us so that we can take a look at it and have it in kind of a digestible form. Uh, and uh, again, good luck to everyone for um, as we proceed this one month that we have left uh, before the application window, um, getting together your community radio station. So thanks again, Liz. Okay, terrific. Oh, and that is not my hand, by the way. Okay. The big thumbs up there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Borrowed image. I don't. Everyone. Knows. <laughs> <laughs> it's just one every knuckle. <laughs> or man hands. Okay. Thank you so much, Lee. And again, thank you, uh, Prometheus, for everything that you guys have done for LPFM and changing the lives of so many people around the country. Awesome. Yeah, it's a great place to work. I'm glad I'm here. Okay, thanks again, everyone. Uh, I'm going to just uh, end training now and again, uh, be in touch with Prometheus um, and, uh, and we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks again and good night. Okay. Bye. Do you need me? Nope, oh, she's gone.